second. Do you see me and hear me? Okay. Yep. We see you. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. I'll get this. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. Hopefully you should, can see my screen in a second. Yep. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so as Jillian mentioned today, I'm going to talk about how deer populations are impacting our forests, along with other relevant trends that we're seeing in our northeastern parks. Uh, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about um, or give you a little background on me, my program and why we care about deer in national parks. So um, first, it's important to understand that the National Park Service mission differs from a lot of other federal land management agencies like National Forests in that the National Park Service is mandated to preserve and protect natural and cultural resources unimpaired for current and future generations. So parks really have the highest level of protection short of wilderness areas of any other federally protected lands, uh, but they must also balance management of natural and cultural resources. And so this typically means in parks um, that they're protected from logging. Um, Marsh Billings, Rockefeller is the obvious exception uh, through their interpretation of the history of conservation and sustainable forestry. So it's like a balancing of natural and cultural resources. Um, so it's hard to know whether we're achieving our mission if we don't know what natural resources parks have or what condition they're in. So this is why the NPS Inventory Monitoring Program was established, uh, and that's the program that I work for. So specifically, the INM program conducts baseline inventories and long-term monitoring of important ecosystems to help inform park management decisions. And uh, the program's broken up into 32 networks across the country, um, with each network containing parks with similar natural resources and ecosystems. And so uh, I lead forest health monitoring for three networks in the Northeast, totaling 20 parks from Maine to Virginia. And I've been with the program since the start in 2006, and we're on our 18th season of monitoring this year. Uh, our protocol was also adapted from the US Forest Service's Forest Inventory and Analysis Program, which is a nationwide survey of forest plots. Before i and I worked in similar forests in the Great Lakes region. So here I am in the middle of the photo sampling a plot in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in 2000. And then I also grew up wandering the forest in Southern Indiana. So I've spent my life and career exploring and working throughout the Eastern forests. And this broad pers perspective really frames how I think about forests and parks. So in national parks, our primarily goal for forest management is to promote resilience. And we're defining forest resilience as the capacity of forest ecosystems to absorb disturbance and change while maintaining similar ecosystem functions, composition, and structure. And so here, composition is a pretty loose definition, uh, like composed of native tree species, not necessarily the same species. And resilient forests are those that tend to have an abundant regeneration layer composed of multiple species and a range of sizes, a diverse canopy layer also composed of multiple species and a range of size and age cohorts, uh, forests that are experiencing minimal impacts of anthropogenic or human caused stressors, uh, and are therefore able to support a broad suite of native forest biodiversity and ecological processes, like natural disturbances that help to increase structural complexity and diversity over time. So if you think of like a red pine plantation that's composed of one species that are all the same size and age, with little to no regeneration in the understory, that stand has poor resilience. It takes one pest like a uh, red pine scale to take out the entire stand. And now if you compare that to uh, a mixed hemlock hardwood forest, there's unlikely to be one pest or stressor that can take out the entire forest. And if it's healthy, there should be a regeneration layer present in the understory that's ready to fill in any canopy gaps created by the disturbance. And so um, in this mixed hemlock hardwood forest, there's a, a lot of response variability to forest uh, disturbance. And so um, therefore there's more resilience than the red pine plantation. And so in the inventory monitoring program, the management recommendations that we provide to parks have this objective in mind. And in particular, we try to identify any stressors that are reducing resilience 
or that are impairing ecological processes or impacting biodiversity. Uh, but it's also important to understand that parks have to balance natural and cultural resource management objectives, which may require different approaches to achieve different goals. And so it's up to the parks to prioritize and determine what actions to take to meet their management objectives. Okay, um, so we can't talk about forest resilience without talking about stand dynamics. And so in most um, eastern forests, including the northern hardwoods of New England, uh, forests develop along a fairly predictable um, trajectory following a major disturbance. Uh, so the figure here is a simplified version of that showing the progression from uh, the initial establishment of often shade intolerant seedlings, for example, aspen and paper birch, uh, after a stand replacing disturbance, and then those seedlings then grow up to form a canopy where stem exclusion happens. Uh, basically, there's a, the number of stems thin. And then um, pioneer species like aspen and paper birch can't regenerate under their own shade. So over time, assuming the stand isn't logged, a new cohort of shade tolerant seedlings like sugar maple and beech begin to establish. Uh, and over time, the canopy of aspen and birch is then replaced with shade tolerant species like sugar maple and beech, assuming no major disturbance. So as the stand progresses, complexity continues to increase with a full range of size and age classes from the understory to the canopy. And then coarse weedy debris and tip up mounds also become important microsites for regeneration. So tip up mounds are just created when trees fall uh, and it's the root mounds that are exposed to soil. And so in northern hardwood forests, fine scale mortality of a single or a few trees is the most common natural disturbance with uh, large scale stand replacing disturbances rare, uh, like, you know, hundreds to thousands of years rare. Uh, and across the landscape, this leads to a patchwork of species and size classes and resilience develops over time. So prior to European settlement, the vast majority of New England forests were in these last two stages, uh, mature late successional old growth, um, and that's what most interior forest species are adapted to. The vast majority of forests in our parks that we monitor are also in these stages. And so that means the presence of the regeneration layer is critical to the resilience of these forests. Uh, so this is a picture from Acadia National Park to kind of demonstrate the concept. Uh, this is a maturing spruce fir stand that's starting to develop more of a patchwork of age classes. And uh, cores from trees taken near this plot are uh, range from 100, 110 to 130 years old. Uh, and in the forefront, there are lots of small spruce seedlings and a few saplings growing under a closed canopy. And then behind us, there's a canopy gap and you can see light coming in from the upper right part of the photo. And so what was once probably like the foreground is now now a wall of regeneration, mostly saplings, so, you know, bigger versions of seedlings uh, that are growing up to fill in the canopy from below. And so the forests here are increasing in patchiness and complexity, and this is good for resilience. And so in most cases, this is what eastern forests are supposed to do once they reach that mature level uh, or mature stage, uh, and they can maintain themselves through these seedlings banks that are also called advanced regeneration, if you've ever heard that term. And so these seedling banks, they hang out under the canopy until a gap forms, and then they can respond and grow rapidly to fill in the gap from below. Uh, and this is just a northern hardwood example, since many of you are probably in northern hardwoods, where there's a gap on the right side of the photo. And so uh, there's regeneration throughout, but the regeneration is bigger and taller um, in the gap. And so this forest is patchy. Uh, I think it's also important to know that some tree species like hemlock and yellow birch aren't able to germinate in the thick forest duff layer like sugar maple can. Uh, and so that might sound like a losing strategy, but tip up mounds and coarse weedy debris were common features of hardwood forests prior to European settlement. And these species evolved to regenerate on these habitats instead of in the leaf litter. And so uh, the photo on the left is of a nurse log in Acadia with some conifer seedlings growing out of it. And then the yellow birch on the right is from Marsh Billings, actually, uh, and it got established on a stump or a tip up mound, uh, which has since decayed and left the exposed uh, roots. And so eastern forests need these types of features to promote diverse regeneration layers that, um, that aren't just dominated by sugar maple and beech. Uh, but they do take a long time to develop and are often lacking in young and secondary forests. And it's also hard for these forests to develop, or sorry, for these features to develop in forests managed for timber uh, because harvested trees don't create these features and natural tree mortality is generally lower in these managed stands. 
Uh, and of course, more than just tree seedlings grow in the understory. So uh, the northern hardwood forests support a tremendous diversity of understory herbaceous plants, including the Dutchman breeches uh, pictured here. And I think the statistic is for every one species of canopy tree, there are on average uh, five herbaceous species in the hardwood forest in the understory. Uh, and these plants are important not just for their intrinsic value, uh, but spring ephemerals are the first native flowers available to pollinators in the spring. They're also important contributors to nutrient cycling in forests. And so when we talk about resilience in INM, we're also concerned with how the non-tree plants are doing in the forest. And this also relates directly to deer, uh, because deer eat woody species in the fall and winter, and then in the spring and summer, they eat herbaceous plants. And so sometimes damage may be primarily on woody species in the winter or may be continuous throughout the year. And the understory vegetation can give you clues about how the deer population is using the forest over the course of the year. Okay, so now when you see a picture like this, hopefully it's obvious to you that there's a problem. Uh, so this is from Morristown National Historical Park in New Jersey, but it could have shown similar photos from other parks in um, the region that we monitor. And there's a lot of bare ground. There are no herbs. Uh, it's only uh, 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 some sedges that are that deer don't browse really. Um, and, and you see a really distinct browse line. Uh, and so basically deer are consuming just about anything that's edible in the understory here. And in Morristown, the seedling bank has been absent for so long that it's altered the forest structure. So as canopy trees die, existing canopy trees are filling in the gap rather than filling in from below. And so canopy trees are becoming more widely, sp more widely spaced. They're more similar in size. And there are also very few small trees. And the canopy trees that remain have bigger crowns, and they're also more subject to wind throw. And so this forest has very little resilience to disturbance. Even more concerning is when you have both severe deer impacts and invasive shrubs present in the understory. So this is also a plot in Morristown. This is from the first survey in 2009 when we sampled. Uh, at the time, there were no seedlings present. Japanese barberry, which is the shrub that you see. It's an invasive shrub. It was about waist to chest height. And uh, even as we were installing these plots, we knew this was a problem. And I remember writing in one of our first annual reports that if this pattern of poor regeneration and invasive abundance continued, that uh, it would lead to eventual forest loss. And at the time, it felt like a really far off prediction like you know something that could happen towards the end of my career or later if we let it go on for that long um, but it actually took less than a decade for this prediction to come true so it's hard to tell uh, because so many of the original trees were lost but this is a photo of the same scene as before taken in may 2013 and if you'll remember Hurricane Sandy was October 2012, and the storm damage in Morristown was significant. And so this was before the understory really had a chance to respond to the increased light. So you just see the down trees, but you don't see the response so much. Um, and uh, so the arrow here is gonna be pointing to a stem that's flagged in the next image to give perspective. So here's the same view of the plot four years later in 2017 and there wasn't a single canopy forming seedling present in the plot and Japanese barberry and other invasive shrubs like multiflora rose and wineberry are now an impenetrable thicket that's over six feet tall. This is the last time we sampled this plot in 2012 or 2022 and it's still the same impenetrable invasive shrub thicket without any canopy forming seedling, seedlings present uh, and somehow the shrubs have gotten even taller and denser. And so here's the full sequence of how this has played out in Morristown. Uh, this is not just happening in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, this is a sequence from Saratoga in New York, which is only a couple hours away uh, from Marsh Billings. And so between the first and third survey, so 2008 to 2016, uh, exotic, honey shrub, exotic uh, honeysuckle, which is an invasive shrub, increased under closed canopy. So you just can see the increase in, in honeysuckle over time. And then in 2018, uh, a microburst took out the canopy in this plot. And now in tw it, it, when we last sampled it in 2022, it's an even denser and taller honeysuckle thicket with little tree regeneration. 
a sequence from Delaware Water Gap uh, shows similar patterns where invasive shrubs took out or took over after a major wind disturbance. And then another example from Catoctin in Maryland uh, between 2012 and 2016, uh, emerald ash borer took out 11 live ash trees. Uh, and what responded in the understory was Japanese barberry primarily. Um, and the only sapling in this plot is a flowering dogwood, which is a subcanopy species. It's not going to form a dense canopy. Um, and so hopefully the, the takeaway here is that this is a troubling pattern that's, that's not just happening in one park. It's actually kind of happening throughout our region. And it's something we're, we're quite concerned about. OK, um, this is another view of an invasive shrub thicket in Morristown. Uh, believe it or not, there are actually four people in this photo. And uh, so these invasive shrub thickets, they're not only a forest health issue by suppressing regeneration, they're also a human health issue. Um, so research has shown that these forests support double the density of black-legged ticks uh, as uninvaded forests. They're also more likely to carry Lyme disease and other pathogens. So it's bad for forests and also bad for people. And I kind of mention invasive shrubs when I'm talking about deer because they tend to both um, interact and create worse conditions. And so that's why I'm kind of talking about these together. OK, so now that I've shown you what resilience looks like and what it doesn't look like, uh, I'm going to summarize what we've learned about resilience of our forests throughout our monitor, or learned about, <laughs> sorry, what we've learned about uh, forests and our parks through our monitoring data. And so uh, this northeastern cluster of networks, it covers 39 parks that have been monitoring forest health and permanent plots for over 15 years. Uh, that's allowed us to look at regional trends in forest health. So first, uh, in 2016 and 2018, we published a series of studies that used forest data from our parks that we were collecting, along with US Forest Service's forest inventory and analysis data to compare park forests to surrounding unprotected forests. And we examined metrics of forest structure and tree diversity. And uh, through these two studies, we found that parks protect significant older forest structure compared to, compared to surrounding forests. This includes large trees, standing dead trees, also called snags, uh, and coarse weedy debris, which is just down dead wood. Based on thresholds in the literature, which many of our parks met, but surrounding forests did not, these results are ecologically significant. So in other words, the forests in our parks are providing habitat to organisms like woodpeckers, salamanders, small mammals, and fungi that are reliant on large trees and dead wood that surrounding forests generally lack. Uh, we also found that park forests consistently had greater stand level tree diversity than surrounding forests. Uh, and so if you kind of put these two together, park forests may be more resilient to climate change than surrounding unprotected forests uh, because they have greater structural complexity and canopy diversity. And so even though most of the parks in this study are small cultural or battlefield parks, they are protecting regionally significant older forest habitat and their continued protect protection is important beyond the boundaries of the parks. Uh, using the same 39 parks, we also looked at trends in invasive plant abundance. Uh, and so while overall news is bad, uh, we found that invasive species are widespread and consistently increasing in abundance across eastern parks, uh, including 35 out of 39 parks having invasives in at least half of their plots, and 30 parts experiencing at least one significant increase in invasive abundance. Marsh Billings was one of two parks that showed overall declines in invasive plant abundance. And St. Gaudens in New Hampshire, not far away, along with Acadia in Maine, uh, maintained low invasive cover over time. Uh, and no doubt, all three of these parks have really active invasive management um, programs, and that has a lot to do with the trends that we're seeing. OK, for our latest analysis, we looked at forest regeneration using a concept we developed called regeneration debt. So when the bank of seedlings in the understory is insufficient or absent, or the species in the understory are not the canopy species, we call this a regeneration debt. The idea being that when either of these conditions are prolonged, we're either at risk of forest loss in the most severe cases, or a major change in the composition of the canopy is likely. And so in other words, the seedling bank is kind of the canopy's insurance policy to make sure it continues to be a forest after a disturbance happens. If there's no seedling bank or it doesn't match the canopy, there's a regeneration debt. 
And uh, this concept is best applied to mature or older forests with a shade tolerant canopy, which most of our parks are composed of. Uh, for early succession, early successional forests, uh, they're going to have a regeneration depth because the regeneration layer doesn't match the canopy. And that case is not necessarily a bad thing. It just indicates a future shift in composition towards shade tolerant species. Uh, taking the regeneration debt a bit further, we define four categories of regeneration debt. So we have secure, which is where the regeneration layer is abundant, comprises a range of size classes, and is composed of species found in the canopy. Insecure is where native canopy forming seedlings are sufficient, but saplings are lacking. So the bigger version of that is failing to recruit. Uh, and there are signs of compositional mismatch between the understory and the canopy. Probable failure is where uh, native canopy seedlings may be present at low abundance, sapling, but, but they're at low abundance. Uh, saplings are absent, and then compositional mismatch is common. And then imminent failure is where native canopy species are nearly absent in the regeneration layer, and forest loss is imminent or occurring. And so in forests in probable failure category, they're not producing sufficient regeneration for the typical gap phase disturbances of northern hardwood forests to maintain canopy forest species, so like the single tree fall kind of disturbances. Um, whereas forests in the imminent failure category are really like one major disturbance away from forest loss. And as I've already shown, this is happening in some of our parks already in the Northeast. So kind of putting this together into a regional analysis, we found evidence of widespread, widespread regeneration problems. And uh, we summarized the results of the analysis into this large grid, which I know is too hard to read. Um, but here, each park is separated by a column and each box is a metric that we analyzed. Basically, if you see green, it's good. If you see red with a black symbol, it's bad. And uh, we use the, the results uh, from these individual metrics to classify each park into the four regeneration debt categories. And the key takeaway here is that two thirds of the park in this analysis um, are in imminent or probable failure for regeneration. And Acadia was the only park that met our category or criteria for secure. Um, I will note that um, this assessment was based on data from 2008 to 2019. And we just completed another full census of our plots in Marsh Billings and St. Gaudens in, um, in 2022 and 2023. And so I reanalyzed the data. And now actually Marsh Billings just barely makes it into the insecure category uh, due to seedling composition metric that shifted from critical to caution as uh, more sugar maple seedlings have come in from recent silvicultural practices. Uh, unfortunately, St. Gaudens went the other way, shifted into probable failure uh, in the same period due to a continuing to decline stocking index uh, that's now in the, the critical um, status. And so um, here's a map of regeneration status for each park, which is a bit easier to kind of see the regenerate or the regional patterns. And again, note that Marsh Billings and, and St. Gaudens are now kind of swapped in their symbols. And uh, I also, I did a similar analysis with FIA data, the Forest Services data across the region, like the same area. These are the same patterns that are region wide. So this isn't just restricted to parks. We just have a lot more data and are kind of seeing it in, in higher resolution playing out in our parks. Okay, um, so just kind of talking about these different categories, again, like this is what imminent failure looks like and this is how it plays out. For probable failure, um, there's usually regeneration present, but it's often not the species that we're looking for. So this photo may look like a wonderfully lush regeneration layer in marsh fillings, but it's all hop horn beam. I also know it as ironwood or Ostrea virginiana um, and beech is also in there. And so hop hornbeam, it's a sub canopy species. It's not gonna form a tall canopy. It's also really shade tolerant, not browsed by deer and readily sprouts from cut stumps or injured stems. Striped maple is another example of sub canopy species that tend to be uh, resistant to deer browse and can dominate in the regeneration layer. Um, and and beech is, is also a big concern. So beech has the ability to regenerate from root suckers and stump sprouts. And so when a beech tree is stressed or injured, it proliferates root suckers to ensure its future in the forest. Uh, however, with beech bark disease, which has been in New England for about a century, 
pretty much all beach trees are stressed. And so they're all continually sending up suckers and creating beach thickets. And unfortunately, these thickets are genetic clones of the parent tree, making it impossible for disease resistance to develop. Um, and the, the suckers are stunted by beech bark disease, and so they can't really grow into a tall canopy tree, but they're super shade tolerant, can grow really dense, uh, thereby shading out other potential regeneration. And they also form extremely dense leaf litter or thick leaf litter that can further suppress other species. And so beach thickets are a widespread issue throughout the Northeast. It's not just something happening in Marsh Fillings, St. Gaudens. And an unfortunate practice on private lands, not in Marsh Fillings, but on private lands, is uh, to cut most of the marketable species, like sugar maple or yellow birch, and then leave the diseased beach behind. And this creates conditions that are ripe for beach thickets to take over. It happened on my woodlot in Maine before I bought it. And so I'm mentioning this as a precautionary tale to private landowners. Um, and and kind of going further when you add additional stressors like earthworms which make it hard for sugar maple seeds to success successfully germinate uh, and elevated deer populations which uh, browse preferred species like sugar maple basswood and, and hemlock uh, beach has an even greater advantage and is more likely to form thickets in our region and so uh, fortunately marsh billings is actively working on beach suppression to uh, to better promote regeneration of other species what they learn through these treatments will be really helpful to the rest of us who are um, kind of struggling with beach thickets on our property. Uh, okay, going back to the different um, regeneration deck categories, the insecure category often looks like this. So there are a bunch of sugar maple and ash seedlings on the ground here, but they're all very short and they're kept short by chronic deer browse. Uh, and there are no na native canopy forming seedlings that are above a foot tall. Uh, and no saplings. Uh, the only sapling here is uh, actually Norway maple, which is not a native species. This is from um, Roosevelt Vanderbilt Park in New York. Uh, and this is another example of insecure from Fredericksburg in Virginia. So there is regeneration present, um, but the canopy is primarily oak. The regeneration is primarily beech and American holly. And so this is, if prolonged, uh, the future canopy composition is likely to shift away from oak. And this is a forest plot in Acadia that is, uh, this is what secure looks like. So lots of regeneration of all different size classes. Okay, uh, the final part of the study looked at potential drivers of these patterns that we were seeing. And so we compared multiple models that described anthropogenic stressors, climate change and site condition, forest structure, and then a combination of these models. And we consistently found that the most important predictors were deer browse impacts, invasive plant cover, physiographic class, so whether a site is dry, music, or hydric, uh, and then tree density, primarily in that order. So these results basically tell us what we already knew, which is that we need to deal with deer and invasives first where they're a problem. And then we may have to do additional forest management like tree, uh, or sorry, thinning the canopy or using prescribed fire in certain forest types to get the regeneration response we're looking for. Okay, so just to kind of summarize what we found through our monitoring so far, um, Invasive plants are pervasive and expanding throughout northeastern parks. I would say that's probably a region-wide trend. Uh, Two-thirds of our northeastern park forests are classified as imminent or probable failure due to lack of regeneration, and deer and invasive plants are the primary drivers. Where regeneration is present, compositional mismatches between the understory and canopy are widespread. And most concerning are forests dominated by ash because of emerald ash borer, beech, or subcanopy species because the future canopy is at risk. The good news is, is that we do know how to fix these problems, and many parks are working on it. So, first of all, Marsh Fillings has shown that you can successfully reduce invasive plant abundance at the park level. Uh, it's a huge victory on their part. Uh, a number of parks have also started culling deer with positive benefits in the regeneration layer. Uh, and, and so you can see Catoctin and, and Rock Creek are two parks in the national capital region that have started culling deer. Um, and the vertical dash line is when management started. And you can see after they started removing deer, uh, deer densities went down and seedling densities went up. 
Uh, and I'll also mention that even in Morristown, where deer, in uh, deer impacts are intense, uh, in 2022, when I was last in that park, I came across the flowering perfoliate bellwort in the bottom right corner of this uh, of this page. It's the first time I'd actually seen this species large enough to flower in the park since we started monitoring in 2007. And uh, deer abundance had been down in Morristown for a couple of years, giving this plant a window to grow big enough to reproduce and maintain its population before being browsed. And so the takeaway here is that forests don't stop trying to recover. They do have the capacity to recover. We just have to remove the stressors for long enough to let them. Uh, and so now kind of summarizing this all from our spillings. Um, again, I, I just have to like note just how important this is. <laughs> it's a big deal that Marsh Billings was one of two parks that managed to significantly reduce invasive abundance over our monitoring period. And in particular, given the active forestry happening in the park, which tends to promote invasive shrubs, this is no small feat. Um, there are a combination of factors that are impairing forest regeneration in the park. And while conditions aren't nearly as dire in Marsh Valley and St. Gaudens as they are in places like Morristown or other parks that I showed, there are impacts occurring and these um, unfortunately are very common trends throughout the Northeast. And so first, uh, earthworms are not native to our Northern forest and they make it difficult for species like sugar maple to establish uh, because they require a thick duff layer. So the seeds require a duff layer to germinate. And when earthworms are present, it it's actually hard for sugar maples to successfully germinate. Beech bark disease is promoting beech thickets. Um, timber harvesting can either exacerbate or improve conditions. Marsh Billings and partners are, are actively working on methods that are most effective in suppressing beech thickets. And I think we're all hopefully interested in, in what they're doing so we can apply those tactics on our own property. Um, Deer impacts are high enough to shift regeneration composition away from preferred species, especially in, in certain areas where, uh, like sugar maple, basswood, and hemlock, towards browse resistant non preferred species like beech and subcanopy species. Uh, and as is common throughout second growth forests in New England, microsites like tip up mounds and large pieces of poor sweetie debris are lacking for species like hemlock and yellow birch to regenerate on. And so this further limits the diversity of the regeneration layer. Um, putting this all together, the forest's ability to respond to like the most common natural disturbances, namely small scale gaps formed by uh, single or a few tree species is impaired. And in most cases, this is where beech and subcanopy species are responding um, instead of the desired species. I will say it could be way worse. <laughs> in other parks, it's invasive shrubs that are filling this space. In marsh billings, it's mostly beech and, and subcanopy species. Uh, and so when these conditions persist, the most effective way to get a large flush of regeneration to overwhelm deer and beach is to create large canopy gaps, so like gaps over a quarter acre or larger. Uh, and this is where we find most of the desired regeneration in Marsh Billings forest plots. These large gaps, they overwhelm deer pressure because they're so large. Um, I must also mention that invasive shrub management, which is uh, you know, a big part of what the park does and, and does an excellent job of, it's really important to do that before you start creating large gaps uh, so that you don't just create a giant invasive shrub thicket. That's what we've seen in other parks. Um, and so before you conclude that we should just be creating a bunch of large gaps to promote regeneration in our parks, it's important to remember a few things. And so first is, uh, while this works for marsh billings, Silviculture is not one of the tools in most of our parks toolkits. So it's not something that we can apply widely uh, in the park service. Uh, it's also a fix that can cause problems in the long, ter long term uh, if used too frequently. So uh, you're basically creating more food for deer and more food for deer equals more deer. So this could increase deer populations and impacts over time. It does also start to exceed uh, kind of natural disturbance frequency and size uh, compared to like natural disturbance regimes in northern hardwood forests, which can impact species that evolved under these regimes like forest herbs that are shade tolerant and poor dispersers and also critters reliance on dead wood and tip up mounds. Uh, so there are other solutions that don't require canopy removal uh, and that do minimize impacts to the understory uh, that allow you to reduce stressors that are impairing regeneration and so that include suppressing beech and managing invasive plants, uh, which Marsh Billings and partners are doing. Uh, and where they're an issue, it also requires reducing deer populations. 
So uh, applying these concepts for landowners with woodlots, um, my rec recommendations would be first to like learn how to assess the resilience of your forest. So um, you know, learn what the expected understory conditions are based on the canopy composition and the stage of stand development. So for example, if it's mostly mature sugar maple forest, expect that there should be a sugar maple seedlings in the understory that are higher than a foot tall. Uh, and recognize levels of deer browse impact um, and know the difference between deer and hare browse. So hare or rabbits, they, they're really clean cuts um, when they browse versus uh, deer, deer just like break or tear the stems. And so it's not a clean cut. Um, so if you just have occasional deer browse on sugar maple seedlings, um, but you still have seedlings that are over a foot tall, browse impacts are probably pretty minor. If on the other hand, um, you have browse on beach, which are not preferred species, you know that they're running out of their preferred species, so you probably have a deer problem. And then also, if you don't have seedlings that are over a foot tall or that are exceeding the, um, the snow line, then you probably have a deer problem. Also, learn to identify invasive plants, uh, especially shrubs. So invasive shrubs in particular, as we've seen in other parks, they can suppress forest regeneration and can really take off uh, when there's a canopy gap or where um, there's a deer problem. Uh, if you want to kind of be more active in, uh, in what, what you do on your forest to uh, promote forest resilience, I would say the first thing is to remove invasive plants, especially shrubs. This is easiest to do when they're small and you can hand pull them. Uh, they're often dispersed by birds at edges of fields and forests. Uh, and so, and then they can grow into the forest once established. And I walk my field forest edge on my property several times a year for invasive shrubs. And I usually find at least one, uh, but they're small enough at that point that I can just hand pull them. And that's kind of what my tactic has been. Uh, also, avoid introducing earthworms at all costs. So again, earthworms are not native to the northern forest. They reduce the leaf litter and mix up the soil layer, making it difficult for species like sugar maple to germinate and forest herbs to survive. And once earthworms are established, there's really no feasible way to remove them. So just avoid them getting established in the first place. Uh, public hunting in national parks is not allowed and it's costly and arduous for parks to take this on, but it's not a costly thing for private landowners to do. Uh, the proportion of the population that hunts has also steadily declined in the Northeast. So increasing hunters uh, can hopefully help us tackle the increasing deer problems that we're seeing across the Northeast. Uh, and also um, reduce beech thickets. <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned, my property was cut over in the 80s, has a ton of beech thickets, um, and I've just slowly been chipping away at them in late summer using hand tools and chainsaws. Uh, it takes uh, a couple of repeated treatments, but in time you can get other species coming in and including more herb diversity. Um, and it's just, it's kind of a fun thing to do, at least that's what I found. Uh, if you are managing your property for timber, the above actions are probably going to be even more important to ensure that you're not left with a beech or invasive shrub thicket after treatment. And then I also just want to like mention the importance of dead wood again. Like we should all be embracing dead wood. It's a really important component of healthy forests that many organisms rely on. Organisms rely on, and they're often lacking uh, across secondary forests in in New England, and often just underappreciated. So um, embrace Deadwood. And uh, so that's all I have. Um, I appreciate your time and all of the reports and publications that I mentioned in this um, presentation are available on our website, which is up here. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kate. That was great. Um, I think we have a couple of questions in the chat. Are you able to read the chat questions? Uh, yeah, just a second. I'm. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I'm not sharing my screen anymore, right? No, nope, you're good. Okay. All right. Uh, let me open the chat. Okay. Is that stilted in the trends slide? I'm not sure what that means. Um, 
I'll move on to another one until somebody can clarify. Okay, the size range of forest tracks in our parks ranges from, um, I think like 50 hectares, or far, sorry, 50 acres up to thousands of acres. So our, our parks range um, in size quite a bit uh, up to like Acadia's like 30,000 acres or so, or maybe even up to 40. So we're looking at a pretty broad range of forest tracks in our parks. Okay, um, all right, the next question, how are deer cold and what happens to the meat? Yeah, so in parks that are managing for deer, um, there's no public hunting, you can't harvest a deer and take it for yourself in um, historical parks or national parks, uh, natural, national recreation areas are different. Um, but generally what happens in parks that are managing for deer is that they hire contractors, usually it's APHIS to come in as sharpshooters, they kill the deer, and then the deer meat is processed and taken to a local food bank. Um, and so actually like thousands of pounds of venison have been um, donated to local food banks through deer management in national parks. Uh, okay. The other question is, what do you think about the most pressing invasive shrubs to remove in Vermont? Uh, yeah, the, I think the big ones that we see uh, as being problems in the Northeast are Japanese barberry, uh, exotic honeysuckle, so that's um, Linicera, Tatartica, Moroia, or Exbella is the, um, the hybrid of the two. Uh, let me see, Multiflora rose is another bad one. And, uh, and then wineberry, Rubus fina colossius. Those are the ones that we see causing the most problems, but really like kind of all of the invasive, I can probably send a list of like the invasive shrubs that we're seeing that are causing a problem. And it's, um, it, it's quite a few of them actually are able to really take over when you have uh, too many deer that are kind of eating everything else. Um, okay, but yes, honeysuckle is a big one to remove. Okay, yes. Uh, the question was about Japanese stilt grass on the slide with deer enclosure. Yes, that was a large patch of honey of uh, Japanese stilt grass that was from Valley Forge. Uh, it's a park that's managing deer. And so on the left side of that photo was a deer exclosure. It was like a, a green cube of native vegetation. And then there's the Japanese stilt grass growing right next to it. Um, what's kind of interesting, what we found is um, so deer, they not only eat everything uh, that's edible to them, but they also compact the soil through trampling. And that seems to promote Japanese still grass pretty well. But when you when you start to, to lower deer populations, um, the kind of competitive edge that Japanese still grass has kind of declines. And so like you don't see Japanese still grass actually going into deer exclosures, for example. And so it pretty much stopped at the exclosure line. Yeah, okay. Um, Oh yeah, somebody posted something about Vermont invasives. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, is there anything else that I didn't answer or any questions that other people had that came up? How do you had your hand raised? Did you wanna speak? Well, in my question, I'd hit the enter button trying to separate and it just went off. So I was talking about starting to write in had the county forester here in 2019 for emerald ash borer and should I leave it, should I harvest or leave it for carbon sequen sequestration? No emerald ash borer here yet. And, you know, you could harvest some more mature trees, some of the mature ash trees. I did not have this we did not discuss this promoting forest resilience. So this has been very interesting. And then your answer of size range of 50 acres to 30,000, that's a, helps me process this with my decision-making on future harvests. Hmm. So 
Thank you very much, Kate and Gillian. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And um, whether to harvest ash, um, with knowing the emerald ash borer is, uh, if it's not already there, it's just a matter of time. It It's a difficult thing to do and it, it, you know, it's up to the landowner or like the park manager to decide what to do. I think in most parks, uh, because we're not managing for timber like in other places, um, we're generally letting trees die. Uh, if they're hazard trees, we're removing them. So if they're along trails or something like that, where a tree could fall and harm somebody, that we're kind of actively going out and removing them. But um, I think the lesson is to be learned from like chestnut blight, where there's massive salvage logging that happened before the blight really went through. And so there was no chance of resistance to develop naturally. And so we do want to try to allow resistance, if possible, to develop naturally if we can. So not salvage logging everywhere. Uh, and in parks where we don't have to make money off of our trees, that's something that you know our parks can function as. You know, this is a, possibly a place where natural resistance could develop. And we are actually seeing some signs in some of our parks where em emerald ash borer has been around for a while that 95% of the trees of the ash trees are dead, but there are still here and there a few trees that are alive and actually look pretty good. And so um, for us that there's a little bit of hope that maybe there will be some natural resistance that if we had salvage log, we wouldn't see. Um, but I think also like it is, um, it's adding more gaps in the canopy. So it's kind of like helping to create structural complexity. It's adding more coarse weed debris on the ground. So it's not like, I mean, it's devastating for ash. It's devastating for all of us that love ash, but it's not devastating necessarily to the forest entirely um, because you are getting more structure because of it and the woodpeckers seem to love it <laughs> like there are like significant increases in woodpecker populations as emerald ash borer has has moved through the eastern u.s um so i hope that was a, a useful answer uh and i think another possible um strategy that that i don't know if this is something that private landowners can do but at least it's open to parks and other kind of larger land management agencies is um where emerald ash borer is kind of right on the edge, like you're right on the edge of an infestation. So it is kind of present, um, but there's still live ash trees around is releasing biocontrols. Uh, the biocontrols need emerald ash borer around to survive, so that it has to be there. Uh, but it could, um, you know, th there could be some positive response where it kind of helps ash persist over time if you catch it early. So that is an option that um, there are a couple of parks that we've been recommending that to, um, but it's still too early to really know how effective it's going to be. Okay, so I see a question. Um, why isn't deer hunting encouraged through lower fees and higher limits? Uh, hunters are hard to come by. Government should make it easier for those left. Um, I have no experience to answer that question. I have no influence over uh, hunting fees and uh, and limits, so I, I can't really speak to that. Um, yeah, and every state is different as well, so it's hard to know how to answer that for Vermont, um, but noted. Yeah, any other questions or any comments? We don't have any more questions. Um, we can end. Before I end, I'm going to plug our upcoming Working Woodlands um, in July. Um, it's actually pretty related to some of the things Kate touched on today, um, having to do with beech tree suppression. We're um, having like a hike through the woods to be able to see firsthand the forestry practices that are taking place to um, suppress beech thickets. So if you're interested in that. Uh, come along. It's on the 7th. Um, and other than that, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kate, for presenting. And I'm going to end the call. Thank you. <laughs>